Okay, uh, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to uh, 19th of January ISAC scrutiny meeting. Um, just remind everybody to use the microphones when you're speaking. Um, uh, the, the meeting's obviously being recorded and the, uh, the content will be uploaded to YouTube in the next day or so. Um, apologies have been received from Councillor Martin Summers, who I believe it's his birthday today, so happy birthday to it's him. Birthday, it is a big birthday. Um, Chair, is there any reason why I didn't think this was the best way to celebrate it? Well, it's... Uh, I am a slightly disappointed. Um, and also apologies from uh, Councillor John Chesworth. Uh, I, don't, I think other than that, there's no other apologies. I think we're a, we're a full house. Um, so item two, which is the minutes of the 23rd of November meeting. Um, do we believe they're a correct record? Um, I'm happy to move, Chair. And I'll, I'll second. All those in favour? Excellent, thank you very much. I'll sign those off as a, as a record. Item three are declarations of interest. Um, any declarations from any members to, to give? No? Excellent. So item four is update from me. Um, one item I just want to sort of uh, inform members of the... On the um, forward plan, there is... Um, there is an item which is the economic development service work plan um, and I think to get that in before its cabinet meeting which I think is the 17th of March um, we, we really need to to fit in another another meeting I think um, there's been a provisional um, date sent out um, for the 16th of February um, and I'll I'll agree that with the with the chief executive if if everybody's happy with that. Um, the other item that I'll invite Councillor Simon People to to speak on, I, I believe he's got an update from the combined authority um, scrutiny um, committee um, on on I think it's noise levels. Is it Simon? Um, Pollution, actually. Pollution. Jared, Pollution. Same, okay. same area. Yeah. Um, really, what I wanted to report back, and apologies, I, I thought I'd sent an email to all the members with a couple of slides on it, but I'll do that later, um, if people will indulge me. Um, the, the reason I wanted to bring it up, Chair, was that um, at the recent WMCA scrutiny panel, on which uh, the leader was kind enough to ask me to represent the council, um, the air quality issue was brought up. Uh, because of the recently passed Environment Act. And um, for that Environment Act, um, all authorities, and in our case it would be Staffordshire County Council, have to create a overall plan for addressing issues of air quality. But that means all the local authorities would have to do something about that issue because obviously Staffordshire can't really tell us what would be most <laughs> urgent here and then tell you know, stone what's most urgent in stone, um, added to which the problems would be different. Um, so one of the things that we were presented with at the meeting was a modelling of the air quality within the West Midlands Combined Authority. And one of the things I pointed out was that Tamworth wasn't on the map because they'd only done the metropolitan districts. Um, so I asked for a commitment that we would get support from the university because it was Birmingham University had done the modelling that we as a non-constituent member would get support from them obviously free of charge covered by whatever the WMCA had already paid um, so that we could then have a look at what possible areas might be of concern to us because the nature of the modelling is that you know, it's a bit like somebody models the possible impact of a flood. So it tells you where they think you might have a risk, not where you've got one, but where you might have one. Um, and then the discussion ranged around the forthcoming availability of cheaper sensors that would enable monitoring. So what I've asked for was that. I then had um, a very interesting conversation with our local officer, who has had some experience of this 
um, uh, who said that obviously we attend the Staffordshire Forum as Tamworth. Um, the WMCA were not going to the Staffordshire Forum, so they've now been told when the meetings are, because they were going to some things and not others, so you know it's not much point doing that. Can and Tamworth are part of the WMCA, so they ought to be involved. Um, so I've made that bid. She was extremely helpful and very positive about it. And my reason for wanting to raise it and therefore it be included within the minutes of this meeting was so that when in the not so distant future I'm not a member of the committee, um, there'll be an opportunity for people to look back and say, well, OK, that is still an issue going forward um, because at some point the council will have to draw up an air quality plan. One of the key drivers was how close people are to a major road. Now, the A5 trunk is clearly that sort of major road that drives up a lot of factors. Um, and the most recent housing developments are now quite close to it, partly because HS2 is not going through on that original route. Therefore, those houses will now be built and occupied. So it's, that's a sensitive area. Uh, we have previously had one hotspot, which was the Two Gates Junction, which is now, now not a hotspot. However, of course, part of the Environment Bill, now Act, is that the government will set new standards for NO2 and particulates. So therefore, depending on what standards are chosen, those hotspots that were no longer hotspots might be hotspots again. So um, those are things that I thought it was really good to have on the agenda of the committee going forward. Um, and I'm grateful to you for the opportunity to raise it. The email I thought I'd sent was the uh, one which we had with a few um, slides. And although the projections are all for the metropolitan areas, to one slide, slide five, actually deals with particulates and where they come from. So I thought it'd be really good for members just to see, you know, if you're looking at NO2, the driver is road traffic, you know, more than 50% of the model, you know, says that comes from there. However, for particulates, for which they're now much more concerned, particularly around schools, um, road traffic isn't the big driver. So, you know, whilst you might think road traffic, we can deal with that and that'll solve the the pollution actually it solves one kind but not the other you have to use different measures to address the other so again for the information of the committee going forward um, and thank you for the opportunity and to my colleagues for letting me explain thank you thank thanks simon thanks for that update i think that's uh, that's very useful and um informative and i think yes yeah, certainly um I think that could be a future, some work on that could be a future topic um, moving forward. Maybe not for this committee, maybe a m more for uh, for health and well-being, Rosie. Um, but, um, yeah, th thank you. Um, I have no other updates, so we'll, we'll move swiftly on. Item 5 is responses to reports of uh, Infrastructure Safety and Growth Committee from... Um, from cabinet so if you recall our last meeting we took um, we took some recommendations to cabinet um, Tina was ki kindly able to to go and present to cabinet as I was unavailable um, so these were on infrastructure funding statement um, and I think the other one was um, waste management um, so if I just give a quick update on what the um, what those recommendations were, the um, the cabinet agreed that the cabinet regularly review how to spend the fun funds um, accumulated, um, and agreed that the process for member involvement and the spend of sill is clarified by the relevant portfolio holder and a process a process is created where members under the right cr criteria can apply for funding and I think that's something we should possibly keep on our work plan in the future just to check that uh, that process actually has, has been managed correctly and, and, and completed. Um, 
so we, we, we might look at that again in 12 months time um, uh, we also moved a recommendation with regard to the dry recycling that effectively cabinet take note of the need for all areas of the council activity to be looking for opportunities to be more green um, and the cabinet acknowledged those feelings uh, and commits to considering the green agenda in all decision making in in all areas going forward so um, um, it's pleasing to know that the, the cabinet are looking looking um, looking green in all areas so again thank thanks for Tina for taking taking those uh, those recommendations forward Simon thank you chair can I just raise the point that You've championed electric charging and other greener initiatives here and we got feedback at the previous meeting that, for example, to introduce green vehicles to the depot, we'd have needed to create charging points within the depot, etc, etc. Um, I'm a bit concerned that I've seen one vehicle at least go past as I walk the dogs which was, I found out from the Chief Exec, one of our um, control management vehicles for the uh, waste disposal, because it, it was a van. But it was agree, it, it, and it was labelled um, Tamworth and Litchfield working together for greener solutions. And I think what I'm saying is, mm. I think it'd be good to see some actual examples mm. rather than sign writing on the sides of vans mm. yeah. in the near future because there are vans there are green fleets available and and it's it it just i think needs that thought that we we need to maybe invest and make a step forward and and i, I look forward to hearing you continue to champion it in the future thank you chair thank, thanks simon yeah um uh, while while i'm i'm chair of this committee i will continue to um Try and put a little bit of pressure on where I can, as far as uh, certainly EV charging points and vehicles, um, and, and I'm sure it will be back to this um, this committee at some point in the future. Um, item six is consideration of matters referred to uh, infrastructure safety and growth from cabinet and council, and there's been none uh, referred for consideration. So we're on to our first substantive um, topic, which is recovery and reset, item seven. Um, I was going to provide a brief overview of this this topic, topic but um, fortunately, T Tina has has appeared on the scene and is going to uh, mm -hmm. going to introduce it and um, and talk us through perhaps a little bit better than what certainly what I can. So Tina, thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair, and evening, councillors, um, and thank you for inviting us to talk about recovery and reset um, and your indulgence. So, um, as agreed with the Chair, we know that um, ISAG are going to talk and scrutinise specifically two projects within the recovery and reset programme around building utilisation and economic recovery and regeneration. And um, obviously, I'll be handing over to Anna and, and Paul to do that shortly but I thought it might just be a, an opportunity to introduce um, and recap on the proposals that we shared following discussions with all the scrutiny chairs on how we are going to look at across the recovery and reset programme. Um, so before Christmas um, we met with the scrutiny chairs um, with a proposal that suggested that the recovery and reset programme would be broken down in terms of those project areas and the relevant scrutiny committee would pick up the requisite level of detail in terms of those projects. So, um, as you know, infrastructure, safety and growth is going to be looking at the two I've mentioned um, and the process will be that the relevant assistant director will share their current highlight report that I know you've had in advance of tonight's meeting and talk around that report in terms of key milestones um, etc and then health and well-being scrutiny will look at smart working third sector and vulnerability and the customer services offer um, and we've got that discussion next week and then at corporate scrutiny the view and the proposal agreed with the chairs and then subsequently through the recovery and reset board on the 15th of December was that they would have overall 
uh, oversight of the programme as well as looking at the financial aspects and the service redesign project. Um, and then the other opportunity is for audit and governance to then pick up the sort of risk management side of it to give that real quality assurance to the programme. Um, so all those meetings are in the diary um, and obviously tonight is the first of which to start those conversations. And certainly um, we've committed to all the scrutiny chairs that once we've done this first cycle, we could probably review it together and see what needs to be amended or refined to make it you know, as fit for purpose as you want it. So there's three things that Paul and Anna are going to be focusing on. One is just the structure of their highlight report, so they can talk through what you've got in front of you and whether that's the right level of detail that you need um, to do that scrutiny work and what that means. They will also take the opportunity to highlight some key milestones and triggers, so that would help inform you as a scrutiny committee with your work plan. Um, we have got a recovery and reset update on the Council's forward plan for the 7th of April, so there'll be some important decisions approaching that um, time frame in terms of some of those uh, key projects. So that will be the second thing. And then the third thing is to invite questions, because the detail is there and you know we want to get as much feedback as we can so that we can you know use that to inform the programme. Um, so I thought it was useful just to recap on that. Because um, the focus, obviously, for, for your committee tonight is around those two projects. If there are other issues, they will be captured and not lost, but will be picked up as well at the relevant committee, if that's all right, Chair. Um, so, so I'll hand over to Anna. I think she's going to go first with hers, and then Paul's going to pick up his. Thank you. Thanks, Tina. Anna. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Chair. OK, so the economic development work stream. Um, so I'm... I'm leading that work stream. So the highlight report that you have in front of you, it's got four key work stream areas, business intervention, economic recovery and development, uh, town centre regeneration, and the fourth one is Marmion regeneration. Now the first three, they're all linked, and then the Marmion house one is separate and on its own. So essentially, um, business intervention, um, what we're looking at doing is, um, is providing a, an economic baseline that um, reflects any impacts that the pandemic have had on the economy of, of Tamworth. So it's essentially, it's a, a desk-based data gathering exercise that gives us that baseline that allows us then to make other decisions, um, which are then reflected in the next two that are on the list. So having gathered this data and having this baseline in front of us, it then allows us to assess, um, you know, what is our strategy for economic development for the organisation? Have we got our priorities correct? Um, are we resourcing ourselves in the right places across the authority? Um, are the activities that we undertake, do they reflect now the impact that the pandemic has had? We don't know what the um, impact is. That's an assumption that there could be one. So that kind of then starts to look at how do we need to tailor our services, etc., to reflect that. Uh, but then also refreshing um, sort of master plan for the town centre um, and ensuring that we make the most of and maximising any regeneration opportunities that we have, particularly town centre, um, to attract inward investment um, and to deliver something new for the town. So those three are all linked. I, I, in my head, I always think of it as one work stream because they are linked. And then um, we've got the Marmion House regeneration, which is looking at essentially the, this site here that, that we're, we're in today um, and looking at the potential for regeneration of this site following the decision to decant from Marmion House in the future. So in terms of activities, um, for that baseline, we've now put together a brief and we've circulated it, awaiting feedback, but we can now go out to tender. I think we're in a better position now to tender for that than perhaps last year. There's more data out there. Um, uh, there would have been gaps if we'd done it any sooner, I feel. So hopefully we can have all the data that we need for the different sectors of business, um, whether we're looking at um, worklessness, employment levels, salaries, activity, etc. So we should have a much better understanding now. So that work, we're almost in a position to go out to tender and budget is available and assigned to that project already through the R&R &R programme. Um, so that the next piece of work is the Marmion House regeneration. Um, so Cabinet for Council, January, uh, July and August of last year, respectively, um, 
obviously made the decision that we would be decanting from this building. Um, that would be next year, April through to, to June is a sort of the predicted timetable, leaving this site um, vacant. Uh, to arrive at those decisions last year, we did some very high level feasibility work to ensure that there, there was a market, there was some, some viability, some feasibility around could this site come forward for regeneration in the future? It was keen, we were very keen at that point, that if we were to decant, we wouldn't be leaving this site and this building here with nothing happening to it for a long time, uh, leaving it vacant and a bit of an eyesore on the landscape of Tamworth. And, you know, that, I mean, that wouldn't be good for the authority. So we decided, based on the work that we did back then, that yes, there was potential that we, we should pursue it further and the decision was taken therefore to decant. So uh, Cabinet for Council asked for further feasibility work to be undertaken um, just to kind of look at more options and perhaps hone down exactly what it is that could be delivered on this site. So at the moment I've got two pieces of work that have been commissioned that just help us um, look at options a bit further. The first piece of work is further feasibility work so I've got um, some consultants working on that um, we should have that back by the end of January. Um, they're looking again at the potential for different development options on this site, what quantum of development it could take, um, you know, given that it, the shape of it, the neighbouring uses, um, the access to it, etc, etc. So looking at all of those issues, you know, what could potentially come forward. So that's the first piece of work. That will certainly help to inform decisions that need to be taken later on by Cabinet, uh, as Tina said, in April. And then the second piece of work that's currently out commissioned um, and will also be back in the next couple of weeks is a piece of work around the constraints on this site. So, for example, we know there is a substation on, on, on the car park site. Um, so directly underneath where we're sitting actually we know there's a substation is there anything else that we don't know about um, that could potentially be a showstopper for bringing forwards development um, it might decrease the desirability of a developer coming forwards could compromise the design or the quantum of development that could be delivered um, resulting therefore in viability issues that again would be seen as undesirable within the market. So we're looking at constraints to give us a really good understanding of costs and whether we need to have bespoke design or construction methods etc when uh, regeneration can ultimately come forwards. So those two pieces of work uh, we feel will provide us with a framework uh, through the R&R board and ultimately cabinet to make decisions on potentially what could be on here and what quantum and what that might look like um, and, and also the costs that could be associated with any constraints that we find that we need to take into account in any financial planning around what that regeneration could be. Um, in addition, we're also looking at issues around demolition. Um, no decisions taken on demolition, but we're just looking at costs and timelines and processes and how that, that could be delivered, again, as a precursor to the regeneration of this particular site. So that's, that's where I've got to. Um, as you can probably tell, a lot more work has gone into that particular work stream. The priority is clearly you know, we have a date for decant, so we have to work to it as quickly as we can. So a lot of work's gone into the Marmion House regeneration work stream as opposed to the economic baseline work stream, which sets the process for those other key work streams listed on the highlight report. But that's my update, Chair. I think um, I'm happy to take questions from the floor. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Um, I've I got a couple of, couple of comments. Um, the April to June um, decant, as we're, we're currently running, you know, not many people in at the moment, it, it would seem, is, is that, um, for want of better words, is it, is it a lazy target? Could we do that? Could we do it sooner? Or is the, the objective not to leave it empty for that? extra length of time 
um, if, if you understand what I mean. Um, I guess there are a lot of independencies um, across a number of the work streams and, and, and Paul is here to talk about building utilisation and you know, we'll be dealing with the decamp process, but there's there's a lot of moving parts to get us to a point where we can genuinely lock the door and walk away from the building. Um, I, w I perhaps wouldn't use the word lazy, um, but obviously that that time scale was set by cabinet full council of last year, so that that's the one we're working to. Um, and but there is a lot to do. There's a lot to do in terms of the regeneration of the site. Um, to get ourselves in a position where we can genuinely go out and market it, maybe demolish it if that's what we choose to do, um, and have the site ready. And as Paul will explain um, with, with his work stream, there's a lot to do to get the building ready to enable us to decant, as well as finding premises for us to decant to. There's quite a lot of moving parts to it. Th thanks, Anna. Right, and thank I, I, again, I apologise for using the word lazy. It wasn't it wasn't meant in a lazy way it was i was just struggling for a different word um any other questions comments simon uh, thank you chair um with regard to the uh, site anna you you've mentioned about um the fact that we we've taken decisions those decisions are public have we therefore now reached out to our neighbors i mean one one of our neighbors had previously contacted the council about future possibilities for their site uh, without wanting to pretend to be an expert on something if i owned a roadlocked pub um, in a town center um, i might be very interested to know that the neighbors might be moving out and that there'd be possibilities for you you know selling that site as part of a package are we approaching other people to see whether we can bundle it together to make it a complete site that would be my first question, if I may, Chair. Um, we have looked wider than just the Marmine House site initially. Um, we certainly did that with the first piece of work with Aspinall Verdi. Um, we just tested the water to see you know, what was possible, but we have pulled it into the, the, the boundary of the Marmion House site, which is quite clearly defined around this building and car park. Um, so as it stands and um, with the decisions that have been already taken that, and the finances that support the decisions that have been taken at this point in time, it is just, it is just the Marmion House site that we're looking at the regeneration potential of. Can I supplement that, Chair, by pushing a little bit more? If we, if we were looking at the bigger site and are now looking at the narrow version, if you like, that, that bit which is 100% within our own control, is that because other people are not interested or because Aspinall Verdi sort of gave you a view but haven't necessarily actually conducted any discussions with those neighbours? So have we had discussions? Is that where we are now as a result of those discussions? Or is it that they were never actually pursued? I mean, Aspinall Verdi were never asked to start negotiations on any adjacent sites. They were purely looking at the potential and then looking at a long list of options for the Marmion House site. But we have looked just at what the, what the potential is, because, because you have to, don't you? Um, I'm not aware that our neighbours, um, the neighbouring uses, um, I'm not aware that they are proactively looking to um, bring their sites into a wider site not aware that that's the case um, which is why the site is if you like the red line is round the Marmion House site only one of our neighbours chair did actually write and ask us what we might think about doing have we replied to them or were they only looking to utilize their own bit anyway we we met with them um yeah, it, it was a while ago now, probably April, May of last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that, but I didn't know where it had gone because obviously that's confidential to you and them. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. J just to support colleagues and add to that, I think um, to remind the committee that the decisions taken last July and August, respectively, at Cabinet and full Council included, as Anna quite rightly said, um, Aspinall Verdi sort of play shaping um, uh, piece of work which was very high level and sort of looked at the you know all the feasibility around the impact that redevelopment and regeneration of this site could have on the town what 
um, the report in April will do is, as Anna said, with that constraints um, sort of piece of work and the further piece of work around testing some of those feasibility, we'll be able to go back with, you know, what are those wider opportunities now in terms of exploring it for this particular site. So whilst it has got quite a clear focus and it's had to because we need some parameters around that, you know, I just want the committee to know that nothing's been ruled out in terms of future regeneration of this particular site. That work that's now ongoing is to translate that, ho that those high-level principles into what now is potentially some deliverables, and there will be a series of um, evidence and data that's presented through the 7th of April Cabinet report to start to shape that further. And again, that won't be the end. I suspect that will set a direction of travel, which in itself will require um, review. So nothing's ruled out. Um, and obviously, going back to the point earlier around the the decommissioning of Marmion House and moving out of here by between April and June 2023, you know, that is only just over 12 months away. And, you know, Paul will talk about the decommissioning and the need to start and have those discussions around where we're going to be moving to. And again, the April Cabinet report will start to firm some of those decisions up as a ba on the basis of those conversations. So, you know, that in itself is a tall order in terms of being able to achieve that by April uh, to June next year. But certainly in terms of the regeneration, you know, we're in that next phase. We're not pursuing a particular option. We're in that next phase of scoping what that could look like. Thank you, Chair. Th thanks, thanks for that, Tina. Any other questions, comments on Simon? I, have... I don't see anybody else waiting no, at the no, moment, no, so crack on. Um, going back to uh, a different point then, with regard to the master plan, um, you made reference earlier on to refreshing it. We've had some fairly um, strong um, exchanges with the leader over the term master plan and some c controlling group backbenchers saying, but you mean there isn't actually a list of things that are going to happen, it's a list of aspirations. And, and I'm really concerned that we're hearing the term master plan again because to me it misrepresents the situation. As I understand what you're doing with the baseline, is you're saying, well, where are we? What's the impact been? What businesses have recovered? Which ones haven't? What might we like to come into the town? Which is not a master plan. It's about saying, what could we maybe attract? And that's a very important thing to do, but not, I, th I just find this term master plan politically convenient but actually quite misleading because you can't say, right, we'll not down that, we'll put that there, we'll do that there, you know, because it isn't going to happen like that because the market and the world is moving around. <laughs> People are still trying to work out whether they're going to have an office anymore. Um, and so I'm just querying why the term master plan is now being refreshed, is being discussed, because it's not a master plan. It, it's a, it was at one time a hope that we could rebuild the town centre in a particular image. In practice, it's entirely driven by who wants to do what that we would accept. So, I mean, you know, somebody want, might want to build a huge casino and, you know, all kinds of nefarious things to go with it. We might say, well, we don't want to give that planning permission. But in terms of whether they could build it or not, is their economic case? And I, and I am concerned that we'll continue to use this term master plan in a way which the public wouldn't understand. So I, I just throw that down as a caution. You'll soon be shot at me, so um, you can carry on with and use it whatever you like. But, uh, but I wanted to make that point because I've made it to the leader and the leaders acknowledge that it is difficult because master plan sounds like, you know, my plan to do this with the town centre. And actually we're totally reliant on what the market wants to do. Um, you know, we'd all probably like to see a senior living complex in the town centre, but until one of those providers comes forward and says, I'd like to build one, we, we can't do it ourselves. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Simon. And, and I guess um, from, from, from my point of view, I think, I think master plan is, I think you're probably correct in saying it is convenient language. Um, and it is convenient language. It's it, it, it is what it is. Um, and and I would 
it, it might be more difficult at this point to 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 call it something different. That's that would be my only comment on the on that. Um, any other questions and comments on this topic? No? Okay. Um, thanks Anna for that one. Um, I think um, we'll obviously be, be kept kept posted on things and everything seem, appears to be nice and green at the moment. So <laughs> let's, let's hope we can keep it that way. Um, so I, I guess Paul to uh, update us a little bit more on uh, building utilisation. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, as you'll see from the highlight report at the moment, there's only three work streams on there. That will grow over time as we move into sort of the more delivery activities. So this is sort of that preparation work. Uh, some time ago, uh, sort of fairly early on in the reset and recovery program, we actually did a bit of a desktop review of all of our property just to see what was out there and what space was available in that property for us to use uh, going forward uh, to give us an indication as to what we would need potentially uh, in, in terms of space, taking into account, again, as Anna's mentioned, those interdependencies around things like the smart working work streams, because clearly that will have an impact on the amount of space we need going forward. So we did that piece of work, and... It, it didn't really tell us much that we didn't already know, but I suppose it just reaffirmed sort of our position in that actually there's not a great deal of unused space amongst our property other than in Marmion House, which there was no future for anyway. Uh, so across our other property, really we don't have that much usable office space. Uh, and meeting spaces and stuff like that is also limited for us. So from that, we've look, we're look now looking at the options around where we go and what we do. There are some knock-on effects from go, moving out of Marmion House. As you'll appreciate, we have tenants uh, in the building. We have been actively engaged with Staffordshire County Council uh, as one of our tenants who take up two floors of this building. Uh, so those conversations have been going on, sort of f again, from fairly early on in this process, and we're actively discussing those with them. And I think we've now reached a point where we have an understanding around what they want, and they have an understanding around what we want, so that allows us to move forward. Other tenants, we have uh, the... I can't remember what they're called now. It's the support uh, support staffature on the first floor, and then there's the what was the CIB on the ground floor. City tap, tap is it? Uh, so that that again, their their lease is linked with the contract they're operating from. So, but again, we've had ongoing conversations with them, so that we're quite engaged with those. The reason this one is an amber rather than sort of green is that we also have masts on the roof of Marmion House. So there's a formal process we have to go through to deal with those le mass leased, and they could be quite costly. So again, we've identified that uh, as a, risk, a potential risk area within all of this. We've got specialist legal advice on board for that to deal with that one because it is quite a, quite a specialist area. Uh, the other one on this work list at the moment is around the opportunities around the high, future high street funds and any links with that. Again, that's more of, I suppose, just running in the background. I'm, I sort of sit on that group with the operational side of the Future High Street Fund uh, meetings. So it's really just to sort of make sure that they they know what we're planning. We have a feel for what's going on on that side of stuff. So if there are any sort of links there, we can make those. Really, the next stage is now for us is sort of moving forward. Now we've got approvals to actually start finding accommodation and looking to sort of enter into negotiations over it. We do have properties identified, clearly not appropriate to discuss where those are at this stage because you're you know, commercially sensitive and we don't want to affect commercial negotiations. Uh, but we have, again, Aspinall Verdi, because of the work they're doing in the town centre, working with us on that one to start opening up those discussions with, with potential landlords. Clearly, until we've actually got to a point where we've agreed something with them, we don't have premises to go to so as anna says that that sort of april pro program is possibly quite ambitious at the moment all things considered uh, bearing in mind wherever we go we'll have to agree a lease 
look to get moved in or take occupation and have the keys with us probably by the summer of this year to start fitting out with a view that by December, January of next year, uh, sort of December this year, January of next year, we're in a, p a position where we can start getting furniture in there, uh, IT equipment moved in, uh, people trained up and all those sorts of things ready for an April opening. It, decommissioning this building is quite ambitious for April, bearing in mind, you know, there's quite a lot of services in here. There's the lease negotiations to deal with in terms of people who lease this building. So there's quite a lot to go 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 through on that one. I think it's, you know, it's important to recognise that at the moment, most of the costings we've done are desktop exercise costings based on current market rates. They've not been market tested in the real world yet, so we haven't actually gone out to tender on any of this. So those costs could change. And as we know, the market has shifted around, particularly around construction costs, over the past sort of probably six to nine months and the predictions are that it's only going to get worse in that sense that you know costs will go up more so there's a whole there's a whole range of things there that we need to look at and there's still those interdependencies with things like smart working around how much space we will actually need going forward uh, we've, we've got a good feel for it now based on the work that Zoe and her team have done we're looking at meeting spaces because again we know that's where we are a little bit short on stuff so place you know sort of committee rooms and stuff like that uh there is another piece of work separate to all of this around the town hall that you'll probably be aware of that again ties in with this but it's separate from this so th those are the sort of activities going on at the moment i think so when we come to the next report we'll have more detail around those negotiations and discussions on property and whether that whether the properties we're looking at and considering are actually viable or not uh, and then sort of really that sort of work stream plan will progress from there around actually doing so entering into leases fit out stages and the formal decommissioning of this building in terms of you know getting to the point where we can turn the lights out and close the door behind us and then becomes Anna's problem to sort of deal with in terms of that one so it's that handover and sort of doing that but as you'll appreciate there's a lot of work goes into that uh, to get us to that point where you can turn the lights off and shut the door um, you know it's not straightforward there's a lot of work in this building around strip out of IT equipment and sort of you know just general stuff so that that will become quite a lengthy work program uh, as we go forward so that's where we are at the moment like I say it's a lot of background activity the next phase really for me is moving into that sort of doing activities around sort of actually getting that piece of work you know the, the, the piece of work on site done around getting a, an office that's got you know our name over the door and sort of furniture and equipment in there so that's that's all I'd got for that chair so happy to take questions yeah thanks 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 Paul um just, just a quick one from me. That's certainly given me a little bit more of an understanding why perhaps it's a longer process than perhaps I previously indicated. Um, as far as the masts are concerned, then, what, what, what masts... I know we've got masts. What masts have we got? <laughs> uh, on, on the roof of this building, we actually lease out space to... I think it's EE through a, a third party uh, sort of company that deal with those sorts of things. So it's it's a lease for that for that space on the roof for that mast. So that's that's one we've got to deal with. That that's going to be more complex than the county council stuff because county council are actively engaged in the process with us, uh, and they they're going through their own sort of review of property as well as we know and have been for quite a while now uh, so that that's that's the mast on the roof there's other equipment that we have around our own IT side of things so you know I think there's a transmitter goes from here to the town hall for example we can deal with those because they're within our control the telecoms masts aren't within our control they are a leased uh, entity Th thanks Paul yeah I, I wasn't aware there was sort of mobile mobile phone masts on, on the roof and I yeah, I can see that that could be present some challenges, I guess. Um, thank you, um, Tina. 
Yeah, we've also got CCTV cameras all around this building as well, which are linked up to Birmingham. Um, the question I was going to ask, obviously this building, as we know, is very antiquated. Um, the lighting system is, I think, out the arc. Uh, the heating is not the best. It's freezing in here tonight, or is it just me? Um, oh, just me, OK. <laughs> um, so obviously when we're looking at spaces for us, however big that space may be, I hope that we're looking at a perhaps a newer building with better energy efficiency because the cost of energy is going to go through the roof come April the 1st. Um, and the other question I was going to ask obviously is about ICT. Um, with less people working in the building at the same time, obviously we don't need eight floors of people working. So do we envisage the server and the ICT being a smaller space? than it is up on floor one at the minute, or down on floor one, sorry. Um, and obviously laptops and everything has advanced since we've had since we had that server, so just those two points to chair. Yeah, I'll, I'll, picking up on sort of the first part about the CCTV cameras, yeah, aware of those, they're in our control, so whilst they do feed back to uh, the West Midlands CI, they're still within our control, so we can deal with those, so that, that that's an issue that's not not an issue really because it's yeah. just part of the decommissioning process uh in terms of sort of the energy efficiency we are only looking at leasing premises so to some degree we'll be tied down with the fabric of the building as to what we get from those leases because clearly we will be a tenant in those for the short term there will be a standard of fit out that we'll have to meet and it'll have to meet current regulations uh, so we'll, you know, we'll try and get it as energy efficient as possible, but there will be limitations to it, as you know, that come with being a building that we're leasing as opposed to owning, and that you know is only a short term. So the amount of investment will have to reflect the, the term we're looking to use the building for. Uh, so the, the, there will have to be some, I, suppose, I suspect, some compromises on that one just because you know whilst it'd be nice to sort of go and throw in the most energy efficient systems and spend lots of money on those mm. it's whether we justify that and whether the landlords would want us doing that type of work and the impact on them down the line uh, for the for the unit when we move out uh what they're left with so we, that that's something again as part of the negotiation we'll have to look at uh but i think there will be some compromises on that one in terms of the server rooms, again, actively involved in conversation with Gareth in IT on that one. He has some ideas around what he what he needs. They are looking at things more like cloud-based uh, server servers and that side of stuff. Don't pretend to understand all of it, uh, but <laughs> it should mean that we require there. less space than we have now. Uh, which also then means you know you're talking about less cooling and all those sorts mm. of things in general the servers are more modern even if we had servers sort of similar server capacity to now the more modern servers don't need as much cooling i'm told so again things like air conditioning would be less impact than it is at the moment uh, but gareth's sort of actively looking at that because again just as, as that normal process of upgrading our it equipment uh, it, it falls under that and so you know a lot more is moving into that sort of remote storage and, and those sorts of things so it is being looked at but like I say that's another piece of work uh, that whilst it sits under this in terms of physically moving the server room in some capacity it's an IT led project because clearly that's that's their speciality and their expertise Thanks Paul um, Ben Thank you, Chair. Um, just a, a couple of points that I just wanted to just clarify. So you, you said that at the minute we've not identified any premises, um, and then you've just said, um, you just alluded to the fact that anything that we lease would be short term. Are we are we looking at one premises for everything to go into when we decant, or are we potentially looking at more than one premises, and if it's short term, different premises for, for different departments, different premises for meetings because i know we as you've already said we don't have the meeting space at the minute um so that that's the first question and then the second question uh, i just want to clarify so when we talk about smart working we're talking about working from home 
uh, as, or what what's the, the the background on smart working and then I've got a question around that depending on your answer thank you. so f first answer the first question we've identified potential premises but obviously because of the commercial negotiation not discussing those at the moment uh, I think as we get into it and those landlords are aware of the conversations because once we open those clearly that becomes more of a public discussion then at that point so we have identified premises uh, cabinet members expressed a preference for all of our operations to be in one place uh, that was their preference now again that will depend very much on how those negotiations go as to whether that's feasible or not uh, because again if we can't get the premises we're looking at at the moment we have to look at alternatives then it may not be possible to have it all in one place so that but that's that that's sort of fairly fluid at the moment in terms of how those discussions go with landlords uh, again the preference seems to have been from members for a shorter term arrangement so that's why we're looking at that five-year leasing at the moment uh, you know talking five years but you know, it could be shorter could be longer depending on what we need but that, that's why we're talking about those. Smart working doesn't necessarily mean working from home. It just means different ways of working, which could include home working, uh, hybrid working where people do some work from home and some work from an office base, whether that's the new office space there, the depot. We have a couple of contractors who do build uh, our works for us and we might be able to use space that they have. Uh, we may be able to use county council space so it's it's not just working from home and then obviously there's the, the site workers those people who predominantly will be things like street scene who can't do their work from home cleaning staff and those sorts of people who can't work from home sheltered schemes so uh, smart working doesn't just mean working from home it just means a different way of working to deliver the service in the in a way that sort of suits what the business needs without sort of saying everyone must sit at a desk in an office. So it's, it, 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 it's going to vary, I think. Yeah, yeah. Th thank, thank you, um, Ben. If I can just comment on a couple of things. So, in terms of the original business case and financial assumptions that were presented to Cabinet and Full Council um, last year, that was based on um, a, a desktop assessment around what would be our space requirements. Um, and at the time, um, to make it easier to visualise, we, we, we felt we needed roughly two floors equivalent to this building, which translated to um, just over 11,000 square foot. So a lot of the um, asset identification has been about what's simply available at that size within the town, and um, that will be part of those negotiations, I guess. Within that financial set of assumptions, um, and again, these will need to be tested, as Paul said earlier, in terms of what was an estimate and an assumption based on what then is likely to be a real-life cost based on those actual negotiations. But we did make provision in there um, for some ICT investment around the infrastructure to cope with smart ways of working. Because, as, as Paul quite rightly said, and health and wellbeing will probably... Uh, committee will talk about this more when we look at the smart working in more detail next week but that is about you know having the the right location for the functionality of that role so either site based hybrid um, or home based um, and the idea is that there would be flexible solutions in terms of providing desk space and meeting space 
um, within that. And then through the discussions we've had through the Recovery and Reset Board, we've had various political steers around, you know, if it is rental, and again, the business case will need to be brought forward and, and discussed at the 7th of April Cabinet. But, you know, if it is that, then the maximum period for that is around five years. Um, there is a, a, a political stir around our, um, our premises being co-located with our reception within the town centre, so I'm not out of town, and whatever spend we make needs to be proportionate based on if it is rental. So all those costs and considerations were given then, that was the basis for the decision then, but they now need to be tested against those, you know, what's likely to be those those business cases. But certainly in terms of that smart working, there was provision for that. And I know um, when Zoe and her team come and talk to Health and Wellbeing next week, they'll set out some of that. Okay. Thanks, Dana. Do you want me to uh, pick up the, te sort of the premises location? I mean, as Tina's just sort of <laughs> essentially said, the preference is for town centre, and that's where we're looking, uh, and that's where we'll be talking to people about. Clearly, if if there is nothing suitable in the town centre, then we would have to start looking at alternatives uh, and start looking outside of the town centre. But that's not our starting point. It's it is sort of focused on the town centre as our starting point. Simon. Thank you, Chair. Um, with regard to the masks, by the way, um, they, they were, there was an enormous crane here the other day, <laughs> and the workman helpfully told us that um, it was because they were taking out Huawei ones, the, the, the Chinese company ones, and replacing them with non-Chinese company ones. So um, I thought I'd say that for the Chair, who didn't know they were there in the first place. Um, <laughs> but uh, from a practical point of view, um, pardon? Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, no, I don't use that kind of Chinese. I think it's kind of that uh, people are worried about the security links of. Um, so um, with regard to the uh, buildings, will the new buildings that we're acquiring under the High Street Fund, so for example the half of middle entry, will they come under your role as being council assets in due course? Um, Secondly, could you clarify when you said we've had a steer from members? I think you earlier referred to Cabinet. Can I just get you to clarify for committee's purposes that when you referred to members, you meant members of the Cabinet? Um, so those are two questions. Will you get control of that? Will that come under the, your assets? And can you confirm that the steer is from Cabinet rather than members in general? Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. take that on board, uh, Council people, yes, it was cabinet members who've given that steer through that uh, process. In terms of the assets uh, that will come through the future High Street Fund, clearly that's separate to this piece of work. Uh, but in the interim, once we take possession of those properties, yes, they will sort of sit as council assets until such time that they go back to the development for demolition or whatever else is going to happen to those buildings. Uh, so we'll only be taking that interim management just to sort of basically stewardship of them in that short period of time uh, we're, we're still having those conversations with the people project managing the future high street funds around how that how that process will take place and what the expectations are if i may chair um thanks for that paul um with regard to the reference earlier on to having a plan for the future um the half of middle entry that we were going to take control of was I think in one iteration shown as being an indoor market which took little account I think of the fact that the current one isn't necessarily very viable um, would that premises feature in your future strategy um, because it will be a council asset and it will be of a certain size and the plan was to take out retail so in that sense it fulfills those objectives so whilst i'm interested that you're going to get temporary stewardship of it which yeah seemed to me to be the natural thing seeing as you look after all the other assets um who and when will the decision be taken as to what the future use of those is because that that was a key site for redevelopment 
to be honest with you, I don't think I'm best placed to answer that one. Uh, we haven't looked at the longer term uh, sort of future for where our offices would go at the moment as part of my project. I think probably it sits better under Anna, and it's probably, if I can, defer to Anna because it is part of that regeneration programme. I never have a problem with an officer passing the ball to another officer <laughs> or ticking bomb, whichever it is. <laughs> So, yes, I, I, as I asked you the question, I did wonder then whether Anna would be the person who would have to say something about the future use, because I think that is a rather indeterminate area of the future of the High Street Fund, because it was a, it was a key part to acquire it, move it, but then what we're going to fill it with. Yeah, so, I mean, for that particular building, we will acquire it. Um, Paul will temporarily manage it until we demolish it but then we will be rebuilding something in its place what what we put back in is is still for debate we're at, we're only at reba stage one in the design process but we're looking at a space which is flexible which could be used for artisan producers perhaps some retail um, opportunities for pop-ups entrepreneurial activity but we also hope there'll be very close links with the college um, with some of the new activities that, that they'll be bringing forward with the new college space that will be in St Edith's Square and using that space with the college a little bit more successfully giving them some space for students so it's it's still it's still open um, as to exactly what will go in but it will be a flexible space could be used for multiple uses and, and would be managed by TBC. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, when the original outline of the redevelopment of the town centre was talked about, um, there was going to be space for the college and there was talk about the front towards the current Albert Road being where they could have hairdressing, cafe, things that would allow them to do work experience, front line, you, know, you could see the logic of it. Are you saying that those things might now reappear in middle entry? Um, and if so, how is the commercial um, system going to stack up? Because the college would then either have to pay us for the building or pay us rent. And if I was a college, I'd be wondering where I'd get the money from to do that. Um, so I'd be keen to know how we think we're going to achieve the business case that was originally outlined, if it's going to be sublet. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad idea at all. I'm just asking the question, does that then stack up with the original Green Book business case that was put forward? Thank you. Um, so in terms of the college um, and the new building that we'll have in St Ed's, there is still the intention to have at ground floor, um, as you've just outlined, a cafe or it could be a hairdressing, something vocational that allows their students to, to practice and learn before entering the world of work and employment. So that's still the case. We're still looking at those retail units. And, th and that will be really good for the town centre. It will generate a lot of activity um, along, those, uh, along that street towards St Edith's Square and keep that vibrancy going. In terms of uh, middle entry, yes, it will have to run it commercially in the same way that we do the tech or the second tech that we're going to be delivering in the town centre. How we do that yet hasn't been discussed. Um, like I say, still at Reba stage one, very, very outlined design, high level, um, but it's something that we will as an authority have to make decisions on how we manage that process, um, it, You know, whether it's rented, etc. cetera, that, that, that all needs to be discussed. I just think that lays down a marker for questions for the future when I'm not here. Um, and also, um, can I make a suggestion, Chair, that in the light of Paul's report where he was talking about premises and confidentiality and so on, we've all been extremely well behaved and, and not asked questions about the, the premises. But I think if you're going to get a future report, I would suggest the committee it's taken in confidential because otherwise you won't be able to discuss it properly at all. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think when committee has had a proper grown-up session like this, the public are fully aware that negotiations are taking place. There's no loss of public information. But, you know, you know nobody expects the board of Unilever to say at their AGM, and by the way, we're looking at this building and we're looking at buying this factory. And, and you know, those things are not 
discussed in public and I think the public are quite grown up enough to understand the difference between the two but I think you'll get a much better discussion if you can hold it where you can actually ask the questions you really want to ask thank you chair Th thanks Simon yeah and I, I would uh, I would I would agree that um, at appropriate times when we do bring um, the, the reset and recovery um, topics back to scrutiny which I would think will be almost on a quarterly basis um, um, then then at appropriate times if we need to be confidential about any any particular items then then we will do that um, any further questions or, or comments this point no okay well that's um, I haven't nothing further to say other than yeah we will we will be uh, be enjoying uh, bringing bringing these topics back in the in the future. Um, obviously, Paul and Anna have further topics to uh, to, do, to to discuss with us later. Tina, unless you you have any any summing up to do, I'm I'm happy if you want to to leave or you can you can stay and enjoy the entertainment <laughs> for the next hour or so <laughs> as fun as that would be chair thank you for the uh, offer um now just by way of, i think just take on board what councillor people said absolutely tonight was about an introduction to that topic to give you the opportunity i mean i know you've picked up a lot of, of questions around the future high street fund and that's obviously clearly connected to the recovery and reset program but not you know not part of that so that needs its own scrutiny as, you, as you're aware um, but then of course you know we need to get into those confidential areas and you know we'll do that and part of tonight was enabling you to look at your work plan and your agenda for when you can invite us back um, so yeah absolutely take that on board but thank you for all the questions been very useful and we'll reflect that back um, you know in summary when we've been to all committees to the next recovery and reset board which is on the 24th of February by which time we'll have been to every committee alright thank you chair thank you Kevin. thanks thanks Tina okay um, we'll move on to um, item 8 which is the castle curtain wall tender um, uh, I, I, I'm sure Simon won't, won't mind me saying that I think this has got particular interest to, to, to him and um, I'd introduced Anna to uh, and, and and Lara who has had not been to scrutiny before so we'll, we'll be quite kind to you I think uh, <laughs> Lara's already seen what an entertainment and interesting experience it is chair even some of the members apparently don't want to rank it above their birthday so <laughs> Anna um Thank you, Chair. So, uh, um, yeah, just to say, Lara Rowe is the castle manager and has been in post since September. Um, so, uh, the purpose of the report today, essentially, we need cabinet sign-off, um, the financial guidance that we have. If you're over 100k for a tender, you need cabinet sign-off. This particular tender is quite significant. It runs into a number of hundreds of thousands. And so we're going through the process to get cabinet to sign this off to allow us to go out to tender with it. If I give you a bit of background, um, we had a condition report undertaken on the castle in 2019, um, which is quite normal practice, but it did come up with a lot of issues of repair and maintenance, which is unsurprising given that it is an incredibly old building and these things need TLC on a regular basis. So it came up with um, you know, a range of concerns, but also helpfully prioritised those concerns, which sort of gave us a bit of a work plan over three to five to ten years uh, to allow us to kind of knock on the head those that are most urgent and work through the rest when we've got the money to do so. Uh, a really urgent piece of work that was identified was the curtain wall, which is the perimeter wall to the castle. It extends around all of it. Um, and the reason why it was deemed urgent was because bits of masonry were coming off um, and landing on the path beneath at the base of the wall, which also happens to be a path that people use or were using very regularly. So there was a health and safety concern there immediately. Having received the report, the path was closed and has remained closed to visitors since, just to, to ensure that there isn't a health and safety issue. But clearly it remains a very urgent thing um, to do. 
So um, a, a bid was put in for capital money in 2019 for £400,000, which we were granted, um, split between 2021 and then 21-22. Now, we've yet to spend a lot of that money. It's been heavily delayed by the pandemic for, for lots of reasons. And I won't, I'm sure, need to go into those. So we're, we're now at the point where we've uh, got architects, Purcells, and we've worked with them a lot this year to draw up plans to address that really urgent curtain wall issue. And what we said to them was, we've got 400,000. What does that buy us, essentially? What can we do for that money? So if we can do more than the curtain wall and address some of the other issues that the condition report highlighted to us, actually, that would be a really good thing to do. When dealing with the castle, what costs us a lot of money is putting scaffolding up and having it there in place for six months or nine months. And so actually, if we can put the scaffold up once, but not only hit the castle wall, hit a few other hard to reach places that we can see that are all linked. Actually, wouldn't that be really good value for money? Additionally, um, as time goes on, the castle will deteriorate if we don't maintain it. So if we're able to do two jobs now instead of one, actually we're saving money because that second phase of work will cost more money two or three years down the line. So we thought, right, what will that 400,000 actually enable us to do? So Purcells have been working really hard this year, drawing up the plans, getting those architectural drawings in place. And with cost consultants, um, we've had a pre-tender estimate of just over 300,000, which if you include all their fees and some work we've already done on structural surveys, we are there or thereabouts on our 400,000. So actually, we've got to the point where we can only do the curtain wall. And a lot of that is because materials have gone up in price. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard this many times, but we are in that place with, with this project as well. And given the sort of special nature of it, it has pushed it right up to our maximum budget, pretty much. So we wrote the report as we're doing the sign-off process, the 151 officer said, actually, you've got value for money if you can do more, which was our original intention. We just couldn't afford it. It was outside the scope of the budget. So we, we as part of this report, also would like consideration to be given to using an additional £100,000 from the capital contingency budget, which has been suggested we could use in addition to the £400,000 we have already allocated and secured to deliver the project, which will allow us to do not only the curtain wall and provide that robust and secure fabric, it will also allow us to do all the other little bits that we had scoped originally. There is an additional cost, um, but we're hopeful that that budget will al allow us to do that. So the report, the recommendations are um, that we ask Cabinet to approve us going out to tender for the works. Now, when we tender, the costs might go down by half, they might go up by double. So there, there is clearly a conversation to have after that. Um, and we don't know, because at the moment, it's all estimates. We're also asking Cabinet to consider this additional 100K from the capital contingency budget just to allow us savings over time. In the way that I've said, the scaffold, reducing the deterioration of the building and then to ask approval for delegated authority in consultation with our portfolio holder when the tenderers are, are back in and we've got those tenders to then um, appoint the most financially suitable one to fit the works. So that's the purpose of the report. It has evolved a little mm. bit over the last week whilst we've been trying to prepare it but I think we're in a really good place where we can do the maximum we can for the money and actually save ourselves a lot of money at the same time. So, Chair, uh, both Laura and I are happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Anna. Um, I don't have any questions at the moment. Andy. Thank you, Chair. Um, does the so the additional 100k just to confirm that does cover everything that you that you'd want to do with the scaffolding up? That's correct, isn't it? So, so all the additional scope that we ask them to look at, it will cover the additional scope. Do you want to give any more detail on what, what it covers? What the yeah. Scope is? yeah. Thank you. Yes, just to probably give some detail about the additional works. Um, these additional works are not 
are not nice to have jobs. They are also essential. Um, so what the difference between the curtain wall work specifically, which is an immediate hazard, um, and the additional works is that they were um, recommended to happen within a range of five years. Now with that report is three years old, so that fabric is deteriorating. Mm. Um, and the the savings really, as well as the um, as well as the scaffolding and the um, the you know the work that needs to take place, um, are also on the disruption. So if we do this work twice, or if we do it over several years, we've obviously got a business um, disruption cost. Um, the work is extensive if we go for the full range. So it covers not just the curtain wall. Um, it also looks at. Um, the chimney, the great hall roof, um, it looks at uh, windows in the great hall, it also looks at repairs to the staff room roof, um, also to the skylight, the passageway and the external walls um, and all of that is linked because of, the, um, because of the structures that will be put in place to do the work on the curtain wall and making mm. use of those to do other essential works. Okay. Um just another question, if I may, Chair. Do we uh, have we built a an inflation contingency into that figure as well to allow for? I mean, we're, we're reading all the time that um, inside the next sort of year or two, we're, we're going to see a ten percent to twenty percent squeeze on, on on material costs. So, is that being built in as well to that one hundred k? It has. There's, there's um, a ten percent contingency into those costs. Just ten percent. Just ten percent. Yes. Okay. There may be a risk there because I've seen through different other work streams and my own job, we, we've seen sort of up, upwards towards a 20% increase and that's what we, you know. I think we absolutely accept that, don't we? Yeah. Um, I think I would say that the costs that we've had to date are estimates. So I think what we have to do is go out to tender, see who's interested, see what prices they put on it, so what the costs are, and revisit it. Mm. And 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 I I I do, um, yeah, fully take on board the point you're making. Yeah. Ten percent seems a little bit too low. Yeah. Um, yeah, just just a comment rather than a question. I, I mean, it it absolutely seems an obvious and sensible thing to 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 sort of try and hit hit all these jobs in in, in one go. Um. It, it, it would almost seem foolish not to. Um, so, so, so I'm 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 very very keen on the on the on the strategy and the approach taken. Um, I just uh, I know that I've got a couple of other people waiting. So, yeah, thank you, Chair. It's just a. Uh a practical question really um, we talk about disruption and obviously it's much better if we can have it in one bulk um, what sort of length of time of disruption are we talking about so the the works if we can do them all together will create minimal disruption to the great hall which is obviously a space that we're keen to preserve because it's one of our hiring spaces and it's also the space that we use mostly for visitors if we go in um, two phases the works have to take place in a different way so we will need props and scaffolding in the hall um, the plan is if we can go for the project as a whole most of the scaffolding will be on the outside of the building so whilst the disruption is as it is at the moment at Actually, where there's certain parts of the perimeter wall that you can't access, um, it will be minimised if we can if we can put the scaffolding up in a way that allows us to do the entire project. About six months, most we're hoping. Okay, thank you. That's what I was after. Yeah. Can, can I just just start in a, 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 an extra question? Um, six months from 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 what sort of starting point? Um, is it something that will be done over over summer or is it a winter project? So I'll just try and get a bit of a handle on that. Um, I think the preference is always to do work like this when the weather's good because you get a good run at it. Um, over the winter it, it is much harder and the days are much shorter as well so it, it takes longer to achieve the same thing. Um, essentially what we have to do, subject to approvals, is 
finish the tender and we've got the consultants doing that on our behalf it's written in a certain way um so the tender needs finishing we need to, to push it through our own procurement team we then need to go out to tender but as soon as we've gone through that process and evaluated the the what's what's received then we can start so i can't give you an exact time scale but i'd like to think that we would be started so spring summer um that's really broad isn't it but um depends on how how we get through that process no one may tender yeah. we're back to square one yeah. but I'm, i shouldn't have said that I've jinxed it haven't i but um so th it's there's a though, isn't it? yeah there's a lot that needs to happen it's a very specialist area of work there are actually there aren't that many sort of heritage building conservation firms that can deal with such a, a large project on such an historic building with the fabric that we've got so it is very limited to the marketplace and who will be going out to so i think fingers crossed we would be able to start spring summer and maybe then finish by the end of the year which would be which would be a really good thing yeah. Th thanks anna and and you make it sound very expensive, more, even more expensive as you as you continue to 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 talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what I feel we should be mindful as far as a timeline is concerned, and and obviously I'm I'm aware that that last year we had a project, um, the play area in the castle grounds that sort of because because of constraints it, it started to impact on perhaps um, the season when when it needed to be used um, and I think we should just be mindful that obviously the castle is is a spring, more of a spring and summer venue and that can we make the best opportunity the, from a time point of view do the job the best opportunity to be less disrupt disruptful I guess that's just just a comment thank you chair um, my concerns really relate to some of the quality of work done in the past where we've tendered out I think on the north wall for example and that work has had to be redone or is included in this work I'm concerned that we need to be able to monitor the quality of the delivery so that we get value for money because I think there's been a tendency in the authority sometimes to attribute value for money to being the lowest tender um, then when it doesn't meet those costs yeah they can be explained and yes things like cement and whatever else you know we all know that there's cost pressures there but I'm concerned that if somebody has previously done work for us, which was not good, I want to know that that is factored in to the tender evaluation because, you know, we raised this in the past regarding um, a previous tender and the leader assured us that he felt that he would be surprised if it was recommended that that firm was going to tender for us again. And I think the danger is it tends to happen in some specialist areas where, you know, there aren't. You know, if, if somebody said, oh, yeah, we, we want to put a, a tender out for, you know, sausage rolls at lunchtime, then there are a huge number of people offering it. And if there was dud sausage rolls, you'd soon change. My, my concern here is it's very specialist. And will we get or have we got a way of making sure the quality of work is what we're paying for? So that that's and I think that's vital for the authority and, and, and important so I, I would just ask the officer, if you like, to tell me how that will be built into the tender evaluation because, you know, they always say in insurance, is investment ones, they say past performance is no, no guide to the future, but I tend to feel that past performance by contractors is actually a very good guide <laughs> to whether they're up to the job or not. Hey, you are right. I mean, there, there has been some less than ideal work um, repairing the castle before which has put us in a compromised position now and now we're constantly chasing to try and make good um we'll have to, we'll have to put it into the tender make sure it's in the tender we're not writing the tender but we will have sight of it and we will push it through our procurement but we'll make sure that monitoring the quality of the product or the quality of the job is a core requirement within the tender something that they have to pull out and that we evaluate specifically to ensure that we get the right people on board ultimately so we'll, i've taken a note of that to make sure that we 
we take that on board. I, I, I'm, I, yeah, I do agree. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'd probably suggest, um, would it be possible to bring in an outside company to do that assurance check, th those assurance checks, rather than, I understand what you're saying, writing it into the tender so that the, the company provides that quality. However, is it not worth us, us having almost like a, a, an outside assurance check that uh, for, from, from a specialist team of architects, maybe the same architects we've used to do the, the costings to come and check that the, whilst the work is being carried out, that it's being carried out to uh, a, a, you know, a, a quality sort mm -hmm. of, the, the quality we expect for the money? Could use Donald in, in shock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So Purcellsy being used, um, because at the time when we started this work, they were the incumbent architects um, assigned to the castle on like a three-year contract. That contract has now finished. We've now got new castle architects. Okay. So we could use that sounds bad. our new castle architects, a firm called Donald in Insul, Insul, Insul. Thank you. Um, we could use them mm. because they will obviously come to the yeah. castle regularly, and we can kind of tack on a bit of a quality assurance uh, mm. program with them and that probably would oh, I'd like to think that might satisfy your concerns yeah I think it provides an outside level of assurance yeah, rather different. than the, you know the, the, the person laying the cement telling you it's the right cement to use you know. Chair in the, the light of the response from Anna to my point and to the one that's just been raised could I ask that those points go from this committee to cabinet as uh, you know as we do with some other reports to say look when you discuss this item we you know these things need to be built into your understanding because i think the portfolio holder needs to recognize that the, it wasn't his portfolio at the time the last work was done but you know there's supposed to be some accountability from portfolio holders and i think being warned in advance that this is an issue they need to take note of it at cabinet. That, thanks, Simon. I'm, I'm, as you were speaking, I was just scribbling, scribbling something that we could, we could perhaps u um, use as a as a recommendation. I mean, this item is is at cabinet tomorrow night actually, um, um, for determination. And so I was just frantically just scrib scribbling um, something we could we could we could perhaps take as a committee. Um, Can I ask you to share that with us, Chair? I, 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 once I've finished scribbling, yes. Any further questions or comments to give me a little bit of time? Can I, I'll just make a comment. Um, not that many months ago now, um, I went with my mother-in-law, who's 80, we were celebrating her 80th birthday, or rather <laughs> the post-COVID late celebration of it, um, and we went to um, Madeira, and we noticed that this chap advertising a hawk school was walking around the breakfast area outside in the hotel, um, and it dawned on me that there might be more than one reason to this and um, it turned out that it was right when we asked him they asked him to patrol the breakfast area not so much to advertise the courses um, but because it avoids pigeons um, and it did strike me that as pigeons have been an enormous problem in the castle I'm wondering whether one could you know find a way to integrate um, a, a medieval hawk uh, activity with having them because apparently what keeps the pigeons from entering the space air, you know, the airspace of it is that the presence of a, um, a hawk obviously that has a smell or a scent whatever that the, the bird picks up which basically says do not go here um, otherwise you you may do it once but you know that that will be the only time you will ever go and try and uh, sit on that roof so uh, I just you know, to give the chairman time for um, his scribblings. Um, but I just mentioned that um, because it struck me as an incredibly useful way of dealing with what must be, you know, a, a problem. Because they clearly, what they didn't want was people coming out to breakfast onto a nice big open veranda with a view of the sea covered in uh, pigeon poop. Um, but pigeons were elsewhere in the town, not very far away, but they were never <laughs> on the hotel front because they were a hawk. 
So, just a thought. Is that giving me enough time, Chair? See, I'm so helpful. You will really miss me in one way when when I go. I appreciate. I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate that, and I haven't quite finished, but I'm I'm happy to uh, to share what I've written down so far. So I was I was thinking that we could re invest uh, recommend that that cabinet investigate the opportunities to use an external quality assurance um, or an external an external um, contractor. Chair, Chair, rather than investigate, because the Cabinet do need some clear guidance, could we pick up on the uh, Councillor's suggestion? It's a third line of defence of assurance from an outside contractor to provide the necessary quality checks. Yeah, I think though, Councillor, what I was going to do was pick up your point, but because he's, he's waiting for the, the magic words. I'm, um, I'm waiting for Andy to actually right. make the recommendation. Yeah, well, of course you are, because it's the only way you can, you know, put anything down. Um, what I was suggesting was picking up his point, so rather than saying the Cabinet investigate, that the Cabinet instruct that as part of the process the contracted architects act as quality assurance during the process. That's actually what yeah. Councillor had suggested. I, I mean, I try and listen to him. I, I suggest you do too, Chair. You know, I mean, that vacancy in the Cabinet that's coming up, you know, you, you, you want to assure your place forward, you know. I appreciate your advice, Simon. Thank you. The last um, person who I advised on that is now leader of the council, so I'd <laughs> listen to my advice if I were. Um, I'm, 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 I'm happy with those words. If that's, yeah, no, if, that if, if, if that sort of, if, if that's, uh, if that's um, a recommendation, or we, we, we should take forward, and I'm happy to second that. Uh, that recommendation. The second recommendation, Chair, was that um, previous contractors' performance be included in the tender appraisal. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that as well. The officer had said she'd noted it, but I think it gives it yeah. more strength if, if it's noted that not only did she note it, but that we'd actually all spotted it oh, as something like that. Um, I th I th and, and could we suggest that one of those recommendations is put forward by a colleague and the other one's mine, and you Absolutely. can second I'll both second, if you like? I'll second both. Oh, and this is why he's chair, and I'm he's got it. I'm happy to move them both on, on block. All those in favour? Excellent. <laughs> more, more so for me. <laughs> um, any further questions or comments from members? Excellent. Just thank it, the officers yeah. for the report. Thank you very much, Anna and um, Lara, for, for for your input, and um, I'll see you again tomorrow night at, at cabinet now. <laughs> 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 um, Anna, I think, I think, I think, I don't think we need you for for any further uh, further yes. further items. So you're welcome to leave, unless you want to stay f in for our continued entertainment. And I extend that to Lara as well. <laughs> Pigeons isn't an item currently on our, our agenda. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, moving on to item nine, which is uh, the update on council housing repairs policy. So, so this was uh, a report was considered by cabinet on the 16th of December, I think it was where Cabinet approved in principle that the updated Council House Repairs Policy um, was approved and, and was being consulted with, with residents. Um, so I've asked Paul if he can come and just give us a, an overview as to where we are and, and, and really how perhaps we can, we can get involved in the process as well. So um, Paul. Yeah, it's going to be fairly brief. We haven't really done a great deal with it since the uh, since the cabinet report. Obviously, the, cab the as you said, the the cabinet report went at sixteenth of December, so you know, very close to Christmas. Not a great deal of time really to sort of do much prior to that. Uh, really, the the report ta taken forward was, was 
to approve the outline draft uh, uh, policy. It's really a refresh of what we've got at the moment. It was last looked at in 2016. It, it remains largely fit for purpose. There are a few amendments to it, and particularly around building safety, uh, because that's quite high on obviously everyone's agenda at the moment. Uh, and I think you know, sort of, we we've discussed previously at committees around things like electrical safety and gas safety and fire safety. So really, the repairs policy picks up a little bit more around those and goes into a bit more details around those areas than perhaps previously uh, was included in the repairs policy. Uh, that's in sort of anticipation of when sort of the regulator starts looking at housing again and starts going into housing inspection again. That high on their agenda is likely to be building safety and sort of the you know some sort of housing safety in general. So whilst the building safety bill, which will go through I believe sort of at April time, is predominantly focused on higher risk buildings, which really is looking at high rise buildings. The regulators likely to look at that wider scope of how social housing and building safety in general across uh, social housing. So it picks up those. It also sort of takes up some of the uh, feedback we've been getting through uh, the work that Ali and her team do. So as you'll be aware, when we started the new contracts April 2020, we also took the call centre back in house, uh, and one of the one of the key tasks that was allocated to that call centre was doing some customer feedback and they do that on a regular basis and that gets reported through to sort of core group uh, who meet to discuss the contract and whilst on the whole actually performance has been fairly good on on the repairs all things considered you know obviously a new contract uh, quite difficult start-up period, you know, with everything that's been going on. Uh, but there are some areas for improvement ident identified in there, and Ali and her team do a lot of work around that and do a lot of analysis. And it's it's more than the KPI data. The KPI looks at very much uh, numbers, so it's statistical. You know, it's it's how many days, how many hours, what was done, what was the cost. You can pick up a fair bit from that and you can monitor performance from that, but it's not really qualitative information. The work that Ali and her team do is a lot more around that qualitative information. So we've been able to use that to drive some of the sort of changes in this, uh, in the proposed policy going forward. Also looking at sort of other factors around things like, you know, we know that the building safety is going to have a cost implication. Similarly, that move to zero carbon is going to have a cost implication. So it addresses some of those things in there as well. Uh, the only other thing really we are looking at, and it's still on the agenda, is around moving from the current schedule of rights process to a price per property process. We've still got to do all the tests for value for money on that to make sure it actually works for us uh, and that it's a, a financially viable uh, because we don't want to move to that just for the sake of moving to it the main the main purpose for going to that and i think again we've discussed this on previous occasions is it, it will allow us to focus on delivery of work and quality of work rather than sort of the bean counting around cost of work uh, because once you've got that fixed cost it allows you to focus more on sort of how that work is delivered but it still has to represent value for money in there so the next phase for us now is going out to tenant consultation so i've started some conversations with our uh, the people who manage sort of that tenant consultative group so i think you know we have to take it to the tenants consultative group as an absolute minimum that's a requirement and again when the regulator starts looking at the way we operate they will expect us to have consulted with that particular group what we want to do is try and get to a wider group of tenants though and sort of it's how we do that and again I'm, I'm looking to work with the comms team on that because I know they've done quite a few pieces of work around that wider engagement. We wouldn't want to engage with the wider general public because it doesn't affect them. It is purely a housing related issue. We do have leaseholders. So again, we'd want to include those because there are sections in there around leasehold property. Uh, but I think, you know, the tenants consultative group is quite a narrow group of tenants. Uh, they meet on a regular basis and we consult them on everything because that's what we have to do. Really, it would be nice to sort of spread that net a little bit wider and get that feedback on it. Uh, 
not sure what feedback we'll get. I mean, you know, it's it, that that repairs policy has been out there for a while. There are minor changes to it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what people come back with. I mean, you know, I think again, whatever feedback we get, we'll have to look at in context of what our obligations are. So that's statutory obligations, moral obligations, uh, customer service obligations, but also value for money obligations because. I'm sure you know if you ask if you ask people what they want, you'll have a whole list of sort of things that people would like to see, uh, but they're not necessarily always going to be affordable. So it's balancing that against what what we have to do and what we can afford to do, uh, you know, and recognising that sometimes saying no to people impacts on customer satisfaction, but the, you know it's that balancing act uh, in there really. So that's where we are. We would like to be in a position whereby probably April we could implement that new policy uh, and have have that bought in so we've done all the consultation obviously it could change slightly based on that consultation depending on what that feedback is and sort of how much feedback we get uh, so until we get to that point really I mean it, it's a document that sits on its own at the moment in draft that's the document that will be consulted on but where we go from there will depend on what feedback we get from from sort of that tenant group and leaseholder group. Thank, thanks, Paul. Um, I, I think I think yeah, it's very important that that we sort of consult with that wider that wider um, group of group of people. I think yeah, it's just important because otherwise we perhaps do get. Um, uh, a, 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 too much of a focus group, and I think I think it's uh, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear that we're, we're doing some work in that in that area. Um, Simon, uh, I think oh, was Tina. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Simon. Um, I was just going to suggest, but I don't think it's going to be on time now. We all get a council tax bill through our door because um, with a, a link not be put on the back of that. Be for uh, um, for council tenants only. You've got to send them out anyway. Uh, we have to put information on the back of council tax bills before now. Um, it's worth a look, but I don't think you're going to get it back for your April uh, finish. So it was just a suggestion. Paul, have you got any yeah, thoughts I mean, on that? I, again, <laughs> I'll have the conversation with the comms team around how how we engage. My obvious concern with putting it on the council tax bills is that that goes to everyone. Uh, so it's how we pick out council tenants from sort of non-council tenants. So we need to be careful on that one because what we wouldn't want to do is consult with that wider populace because I don't. it's not appropriate to. Uh, we do want to limit it to our tenants and leaseholders only. Uh, and again, even with the leaseholders, it's a difficult one because some of the people living in leasehold properties who will be paying the council tax aren't actually the leaseholder of that property they're a tenant of the leaseholder so again it's who do we consult with well our statutory obligation is with the leaseholder not the tenant of the leaseholder so it could become quite complex uh, but I'm sure uh, the the comms team will have a view on how we do that wider engagement and sort of how we pick that sample of people to go out to or whether it goes out to a wider group through sort of the uh, tenants newsletters that go out and uh, you know we do have sort of contact and mailing lists for those groups so it may be that's the that's the approach we take Th thanks thanks Paul and uh, I, th I think I think it's a, it's a fair idea Tina it might just might be too difficult to do yeah so Simon thanks chair um, I was glad to hear that we went or recognize we need to look at a wider group of tenants but I have to say I was then detected the undertone of, um, yeah, but it'll probably be too difficult. And I think we've got to ask the question, if all the tenants consultancy groups are held in the day, then we are almost certainly underrepresenting our younger tenants, almost certainly underrepresenting, um, well, possibly underrepresenting women, although if only because more of them may be represented amongst the younger tenants who've, who've been allocated properties um, but I, I, 
I couldn't tell exactly whether that would happen. So seeing as the council prides itself on its equalities agenda, ignoring the younger tenants and those at work skews quite significantly the kind of tenant we're going to actually get to talk to. So I do think it is, is something that needs to be more than, than a pious hope. I, I think we need to actually do something about it um, because of that factor. Um, and, I, and I know, you know, th there's an assumption, if you like, that most people who have council tendencies are older and, you know, don't work. But that's not true. Um, and I think it's really important that we, we try and reach those people. And that may mean that we'll have to have some evening groups. It may mean that we'll have to have, um, you know, something online. Um, but as Paul's just said, it is, we do have lists of those, of tenants so if, for example, online favours younger people responding, then if we took an online opportunity combined with the, the current, we might get to a better cross-section. So I think that'd be really healthy uh, for us to do, to ensure we're talking to all of our tenants. Because certainly where I represent, there's a lot of single households, part-time working. I would think the chance of them being available on a, whatever it is, a Tuesday afternoon <laughs> at two o'clock is going to be quite limited. Um, particularly if they've got childcare responsibilities as well. So we'd, we're in effect leaving out those with childcare responsibilities. And uh, and that's not, I mean, that's not Paul Dean. Now I'm just saying we all know that whatever the, the modern idiom, the fact is that more women than men look after children. Therefore, if we are not including those people, then it's more women who are missing out. So I just think that'd be, a, be really good to see us take a step in that direction. Thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Simon. Yeah, I, I think if that's something you can you can take on board, Paul, as 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 we do see it as important that 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 engagement through different means, and I think if you can take that to the comms team, that would be that would be really really good. And I think, Chair, when the inspectorates start coming in, that will be an obvious area for them to ask because I doubt any councils don't have some form of <laughs> tenancy consultant. You'd be, you'd be really odd not to have any consultants, but, but they're going to ask, well, who are you asking, and is it the same people all the time, and is it one little self-appointed group? So, you know, because in some authorities, they might not have that many properties, and it'd be quite easy for it to get like that. With 4,000, we ought to be able to reach out, I would have hope. And also, um, Chair, I would hope we might be able to include some of those on temporary in temporary accommodation so for example if we've got families that have been rehoused temporarily because of domestic violence and other issues those would be missed out if we aren't addressing those in temporary accommodation i'm, I'm not saying that they've got to have a, a whole group of their own but i'm just thinking that recognizing their needs their responses i mean they will have been supported by the council they like to be very positive about what the council is trying to do um and providing proper accommodation rather than b and b is a real plus but again that's a group that we would be missing out if it tends to be regular tenants at regular addresses um over a you know period of time so i think we need to make sure that there's a churn within our tenants advisory group as well because certainly when I was involved in marketing and doing focus groups I always remember we were doing one on um, butter usage versus margarine and, and, and the products that I, I was involved in at the time and one group defined out of existence the group that then came in because actually they thought that only old people used butter and actually young people did as well and it was, you know, it was fascinating listening to both groups and thinking, well, it's really important to have heard both groups because the view is different. Paul, uh, you, any yeah, I mean, I, I suppose a couple of comments on that one. I mean, the first one, we do have a formula, a, f uh, a formally sort of constituted tenants consultative group uh, that's set up through sort of Tina's team. Uh, so we have an obligation to consult those because. That, that sort of set out in that regulatory standards. So we have to consult with those uh, as a group because they are formally constituted. What we're looking at is taking that net wider than that group around sort of that wider group of tenants. I'll, to be honest with you, I will defer to sort of our comms team on sort of how they actually do that because they're quite good at sort of doing that, I, I suppose, capture of sort of 
a wide perspective without having to go to every single person. Uh, whether whether we put can I just say though, legally we must consult our statutorily created group. But what I'm saying is, is that group properly cross representative because of when it meets? I'm also asking, does it represent a whole variety of our tenants, which it probably doesn't? Um, and thirdly, is there churn in that group, or has it become a self-perpetuating group? In which case, it's not that you're not consulting your group. What, I, what I'm saying is, if those same people were on it three years ago, then we're not we're not picking up what's going on within our tenants. If the same people are sat on that statutory group. Do you see what I mean? It'd be, it'd be like saying that, you know, well, we always talk to the councillors, but we never, we, we never hold a meeting at a time when half of them can get there. Um, and then of those who can get there, um, we never change them. <laughs> so it's really just that question that I'm asking. Have we got things in place to ensure that a variety of people get to be in the statuarily consulted group? you see what I mean? I don't doubt for a minute that you're doing all the consultation you should do. I'm just asking who ends up on the table opposite you. Is it the same people all the time? Yeah, no, I mean, th th thanks for that. To be honest with you, it's probably not a question I can answer because I don't deal with that particular group. Uh, so it might be worth directing that through to Tina if you want a response back on that one. Uh, Perception-wise, I suspect they are almost a self-selecting group just because that's the nature of the people who come forward for those things. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to sort of take that to that wider sort of audience. Uh, and as I say, our comms team are very good at sort of doing that sort of, you know, selective, uh, you know, to try and get that cross-representation and, you know, proportional representation of, uh, of the groups. So I'll work with them to do that wider consultation. As I say, that consultative group is there. It's, it's what we've got at the moment. So we have to do the consultation with them, and that's that sort of you know, obligatory. That wider group is where we want to be, sort of to get that, like you say, sort of that wider net. Because there, all, there will always be people who don't want to come to those sort of formal groups but who will respond to other things so that's why we want to push it out to that wider group so you know yes we are going to do that as, as far as that tenants consultative group i suspect like i say probably something to sort of put through tina and probably through the the housing and homelessness committee uh because again it's something i think you know it is going to be looked at when the regulator starts looking in a bit more detail at uh, you know these sorts of things so yeah you know it is a valid point and you know it is something in the longer term we need to look at but again you know as far as consultation goes if we can push it out to that wider group i think that's that's the right way of doing it and if we don't get any responses back or it's you know it's it's not a particularly sort of you know useful piece of work that comes back from it well that's fine because if people don't want to comment on it they don't have to uh, and it may well be sort of you know a lot of people go well actually we're okay with that and it's just the way it is we don't know until we ask, uh, and all we can do is sort of take that feedback as it comes through and filter it and sort of make sure that, you know, what we're getting back is, okay, so this is what people are telling us, what can we do with that? And like I say, that comes down to that sort of, uh, what what are we obliged to do, what's our statutory obligations, what can we afford to do? And it's, it becomes that balancing act then at that point, and sort of those compromises have to start coming into play. Uh, but that, that's a piece of work we can do once we've got the feedback, depending on what that feedback says. Thank, thanks, Paul. Yeah, I mean, it is it is that. It's very much that um, you, you can show the, the horse where the, tr the, the trough of water is, but you can't make it you mark, can't make it drink. And I think as long as we can do our, do our best to, to engage with those people, and, and Simon is, is right in saying... You know, we, we need to give the best opportunity to be able to, to, to get that engagement. So, yeah, th th thank you. Any other questions or comments? No? Okay, so I think thanks very much, Paul. Um, I think we'll we'll look forward to, to seeing um, a, a further report in, in, a, in a, at an appropriate time, let's say. Um, so th th thank, thanks again.
yeah. In, in fairness, so Chair, there was a proposal at full council, full council which yeah. then led to the yeah, full I council will. asking us to look at it. Yeah. So, um, I think there were some conclusions from um, the working group, and I'll, I'll ask Tina to, to just put that out to uh, full committee, as I think you were leading on that. Thanks, Tina. <laughs> Yeah, we had a, a, a couple of working group sessions on this um, and I wrote some quite extensive notes. Um, but the, there's three main points that I, I, I managed to tease out of, of all the notes. Um, the first one being the emphasis, need, the emphasis needs to be on us as an authority, lead by example and look what we can do with our own display. Um, if any of you see the London displays, they use a mixture of fireworks, drones and laser lights um, and I think we can do much the same maybe on a, obviously on a smaller scale um, so that was the first one I think that is a very doable one the second one was to write to the minister responsible for fireworks legislation and I think that needs to come from the leader of this council as a, from a council as a whole again I think that's very doable and the third one that came up several times um, and we were quite shocked at when we tried to, when we looked online at this, uh, look at the legislation around online sales was the first one. And we all then went online and looked at what fireworks we could all buy right at that moment. And it was in the middle of the summer when we did it. And we could buy basically anything within reasonable um, finances which would be very dangerous in public hands and the second part of what that was and then to look on the impacts of animals and how we can help now impact on animals there's always going to be fireworks people are always going to have displays so i'm not sure that that's in our gift to be um to do anything about looking at legislation around online sales well I can go online and I can buy exactly what I want when I want it and I pay for it. Nobody checks my ID, nobody asks me to prove who I am and it's very easily done by anybody. So I just wanted to put that one out where there is it, is it coming from the working group. I think the first two are doable. I'm not so sure about the third, the third one that I've just mentioned. Um, but yeah, definitely emphasis on us as, a, as an authority and writing to the minister as a council to say, this is what we've, we've done, this is what we've managed to achieve. What are you doing to help authorities crack down on really illegal sales? I hope that helps, Chair. Th thanks, Tina. Um, I, I've just written a couple of, couple of things down as, as, a, as possible recommendations. Um, and I'll, ju I'll, just, I'll just sort of read those out just, just before we open it up to further discussion but that, that we look at all options, that the council looks at all options with regard to visual aerial displays I think that, I think that is, um, and, and that um, that the council or the leader writes to the, to the, the minister with regard to um, um, and I perhaps need some assistance with, with regard to the on fireworks. yeah illegal with yeah. regard to illegal illegal sales or I mean just quickly chair I know that a few supermarkets last year took the decision not to sell them um, I won't name those supermarkets because we all know who they are but there was some there was some high end supermarkets that said we're not selling them. Um, and you know that was their decision that was a corporate business decision um, and I think it was a good decision for them to make Thank you, Simon Thanks Chair, uh, two aspects to it, I think with regard to what we asked the leader to write to the Minister about I think it's not so much using the term illegal sales as to saying that the regulation of online sales needs to reflect the current law on retail sales or it's not worth the paper is written on 
there's, a, there's no point having something that says a shopkeeper can't sell them except between these dates if then you can just post off for them at any time so I think the equalization of, of circumstances was was one thing but also um, with regard to the original motion to council one of the elements was uh, the decibel level that was permitted for standard sale as opposed to for retail sale as opposed to public display um, because it's it's that decibel level that means that if your you know, near neighbor sets one of those off then your animals are sort of you know caught in a corner wandering quivering wrecks um, so that's the thing and and in particular I, I would say that the reason why I supported when Councillor Clements courtesy given me a call uh, with the draft of, of points coming out of the group uh, the reason I would support very much the leader writing is that when I had occasion to try and take some issues through about the housing cost allowance I was talking to Andy Street, the Mayor of the West Midlands, and he was also concerned about that issue. And so I asked Council, and we got it through, that the leader wrote a letter to the Minister about it. And then I took it to Andy so that Andy could include it as you know, an example within his area of it being raised as well, you know, show it wasn't just his bandwagon, it was, it was a felt issue. Um, and he said to me, it's really important to have these sorts of letters written by councils controlled by the same party as the government because a minister has to think more carefully about what you write back to someone of your own political party <laughs> um, and he said you know it, it in a way in a perfect world it wouldn't be but in a imperfect world that we live in it's easier to write back to a council who you politically disagree with and say well yes you've got this wrong because you don't look at the world the right way whereas to write to a council led by a conservative with a majority of what 23 well 20 20 seats on the council at the moment you know that is making the point isn't it look we're a successful local party who have strong support locally what are you telling us that we can say to our residents and it makes ministers think so from that point of view i, I would endorse it as i said I'd avoid the word illegal simply yeah. because whilst we might think it should be probably it isn't um but if it's if it asks for them to review that and the decibel level then i think we'll be addressing the two main issues that came up thank you chair Thanks, Simon. And if that helps with your scribblings, I'm really happy. I've, I've, I've written um, the, 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 the leader writes to the Minister with regard to online sales of fireworks, and this reflects the same legislation uh, um, that shop sales um, are guided by, yeah. Um, and and um, I haven't got that far yet. <laughs> Rosie. Yeah, I was just going to say, with um, with the decibel level, I mean, it isn't just animals that you have to consider. Um, there's all types of people in society for which a loud bang or trash could be devastating um, from a, a, well, a mental well-being point of view. So I just want to make sure that that would be covered in it as well, not just animals. Th thanks, Rosie. Yeah, I'll, I've I've gone on to say uh, reflects the same legislation as shop sales is guided by, and that the decibel level of of, of fireworks is reviewed. Available. For Ava yeah. Purchase. I think we were we were differentiating between a major display, which is usually at some distance from houses yeah. and people and in in um, in general, whereas <laughs> if you're near neighbor can buy one of these mega sonic things then then y it's you and everyone else that's impacted on and as rosie says we actually built into the original motion to council the reference to vulnerable pe people and animals it wasn't animals and people we were actually highlighting people and animals um, to make the point that it goes wider than the lobbying of the rspca it's a bigger issue than that Th thanks, Simon. I'll, I'll just 
I'll just read out the two, the two that we, that I think I've got here. So, um, that the council look at all options with regard to visual aerial displays, and that the leader writes to the minister with regard to online sales of fireworks, and this reflects the same legislation as shop sales is guided by and that the decibel level of fireworks available for public purchase is reviewed. Perfect. Yeah. So those are the those yeah. Those those are the two recommendations I'm gonna move and that I think we and the, these these will be referred back to full council as that's where the um uh, th that's where the topic got originally referred back to scrutiny and I think that's appropriate for us. Chair, Chair could I, can I ask that as I originated the original motion at full council which was partially voted down um, that uh, Councillor Clements who's done the work here be allowed to propose them and maybe with the committee's agreement I'd be allowed to second. Oh, I'm totally happy with that. Um, Okay, so we have a, a mover and a seconder. Um, all, the, all those in favour? Excellent. Thank, thank, thank you. And I will find an appropriate full council for that to go go to. Um, it may not be the next full council. Let's 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 see. Simon, do you have a comment on that, or are you happy? Chair, I'm I'm just a humble backbencher, and you're the chair. <laughs> the fact that I can't understand why it wouldn't be possible to discuss it <laughs> at next full council after one was recently um, dropped because of lack of business, I'm not sure. I, 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 I would have thought as an aspiring cabinet member, you'd be pushing. <laughs> feel humble um, okay so um, that is that is dealt with item 10 so yeah item 11 focus half day so if you recall um, if, we, if, we, if we sort of rewind sort of 12 months or so um, we, we look at um, the community safety partnership um, topic usually in sort of March time and we have um, uh, usually the, the member of the police force with us to to assist in that and, and Joe Sands does a great job um, presenting that and we um, we look at all aspects of, of, of that topic and th this this sort of term we We've sort of thought maybe we can do something a little bit different. It's something myself and, and, and Tina have, have, have spoken about, and and so we've we've decided to have a more more of a focus day or focus afternoon, which perhaps gives us a little bit more time to to drill down into some of the some of the topics. It will will be um, not a formal scrutiny meeting. It'll be. Uh, as it says, a focus focus day, more like a working group, but with the the same sort of invitees. We're we're we're, we're going to have Ben Adams available to us as well, um, and then then out of that, obviously, we will need to make recommendations through um, and constituted scrutiny committee um, to to really tick all the boxes. Um, so. Really, it was just um, a little bit of information. If anybody's got any particular topics that they want to see see brought up, I know we've we've, we've spoken previously about like e-scooters and and things. It might be worth letting people know what we've already thought about. If yeah. you've got the list or Joe's got the I list. I think I think what I'd like to do is 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 probably send it. A, if I can send that around after the meeting. Um, and then, if if anybody's got any topics or question, particular questions, then um, if we can feed those through before that meeting, which I think is going to be on the on the fifteenth, yeah. Chair, can I just say I I have already raised e-scooters with Ben Adams, so I'd very much like to have it 
in yeah. that list which you've appeared to because I'd I've written to him and I mean he gave me a very positive as he always with Ben a mm. uh, very positive response about some of the issues but clearly it's not going away it's an issue so I think it needs needs addressing and it'd be a good opportunity because we have more than five minutes to do it yeah Th thanks Simon Rosie did you just say the 15th of Feb uh, yes. What sort of times are we looking at? Because I do have some chalk. One, one o'clock, I think we've we've sort of penciled. Yeah, in. that might be difficult for me on the Tuesday. Okay. Well, it's that's it's. Uh, Unless we can call it a hybrid meeting, and I can. I haven't even considered that, no. to be honest. No. Let's let's I'll let's see. It's it it's going to be that open. Be difficult for me. It's open to all councillors. It's not just. Yeah. This this committee. Yeah. I'm not expecting everybody to be available. We we we, we can't always be available for for every meeting, particularly that it's in a daytime. But I would I'd hope hope if people can make an effort, even if they they just drop in for half an hour or so. That's that's kind of the the thing. It's not nobody has to be there all the while. That's the way I sort of envisaged it. Um, it, it, it's it's certainly something. Absolutely, and 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 actually, t t Tina Tina is going to be leading on this topic, aren't you? Aren't you, Tina? Is she now? Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think Tina know about that either. Tina Tina, Tina did t Tina did 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 know about it. Um, no, we'll be doing a, a great great double act I think um, it's it's something that I think County Council uses um, as a as a, a scrutiny tool um, and so we thought we'd try try and try something a little bit different if it doesn't work it doesn't work but we thought we'd give it a give it a go um, so that's just a bit of a briefing on that I'll, I'll we'll distribute um, a list. I think maybe um, if we can send round the community safety partnership, the minutes from last, from the last uh, meeting last year, that might assist some of the newer members to the to the committee as well. Sure. The yeah. only thing I was going to ask is, it's become apparent. I think you wrote, you raised it about the. Uh, I think we need some um, answers about the Smart Alert app. Because yeah. it's non-existent and apparently it hasn't been non-existent for two years. Yeah, that's obviously the reason why um, Matthew Ellis is not. Yeah. <laughs> so I, think, I think we need that because we, yeah. we we got everybody to sign up to it, include residents at uh, um, our residents yeah. meetings, and now all of a sudden they can't use it. So we need to know what's going on there and what's going to come. And and it's not so. It, yeah. Doing it off a web web page isn't so no, accessible, no. is it? So that's so a, it's a good add good that point. to the list, yeah. Joe. That'd be fine. Yeah. I have to say when I took an opportunity. going to say chair that the I joined on the email so I'm I'm getting alerts every single single day but no you, you're not getting them that's not accessible for Joe public that's only if you're a councillor or a leader or, or somebody that's got a position the members of the public can't currently do it because it came up when uh, my husband tried to do it what's your position and he, he couldn't register so, so that again, it, it's a topic we we just identified. It will go into the um, into the mix. So, yeah. Any questions or further questions or comments on that? I think. Yeah. Just to say, chair, if it, like you've just said, even if you can just pop in for half an hour mm. or an hour, we really do need the input to make it work. Um, we don't want me and Simon just sat here questioning Ben and Joe and and the, the new chief of police for Tamworth. We do need member input. And I, and I know that, you know, guys, you work and, and stuff like that, but if you can send any questions over as well. Yeah. Um, it's something we're going to learn from here at Tamworth. We do this all the time at County. And it's and it's um, it's a great tool for teasing out information from members that don't want to speak in a, perhaps a, a public meeting. 
Um, so you can get some some people get really nervous about mm. speaking at a public meeting. So it is a good opportunity, um, and we'll if it doesn't work, then so be it. But we'll learn from it, yep. and 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 hopefully make the next one better if we do it again. Yeah, thank thanks. Think, thanks think, yeah, that that does bring out a good point. If people can't attend, yeah. then then it's more than make sure that those questions are, are raised on their behalf. Yeah. We can share them out or something to make sure that yeah, there's a variety of questions asked. A absolutely. Thank, thanks, Simon. Okay. Um, item 12 is a forward plan. Uh, we, we had a new forward plan get sent out first thing this morning, actually. Uh, Simon. Yes, probably to make sure that scrutiny didn't see it first. Um, <laughs> can I can I just say that on the uh, forward plan that's been issued this morning. There's an item on the summer activity plan that yep. is confidential. I'm struggling to understand how the activity plan can be confidential, oh, 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 <laughs> unless it's to do with the costing of the. But I, even so, but the other thing I was going to say was I was asked a question. Um, well, in fact, both of us were asked a question, weren't we? Um, as to what was happening for the Queen's Platinum oh, Jubilee oh, <coughs> and at the last meeting we were told that flower plans are in hand but presumably more than that was going to happen um, so can I suggest that if that goes on our forward plan that particular thing the summer activity plan and the Jubilee oh, okay so I'll I think I think that was mentioned at the health and well-being scrutiny yeah, we've got and I think it's on your week, work so. plan isn't it yeah. so it's dealt with as long as it's been another committee it's fine by me. Yeah. yes we've got um, Sarah coming to our meeting next week so uh, Chair, just to update as well AD Ramsell did come back to me today and said that they it's been ratified today but they've had to wait on the BBC because obviously it's um, a licensed event and they've got to apply for certain licences before they can do anything. Okay. Um, so he said he was hoping for ratification today. I've had the email this morning. Okay, thank you. Um, Sorry, what's a licensed event? The the Jubilee? Uh, the Queen's event is a licensed event. Oh, her event? Yeah. Oh, right. No, I thought you meant we were having to get permission in Tamworth yeah. to celebrate. <laughs> 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 we seemed, do you know what I mean? That's what I thought, really? Surely they no. wanted to happen. Just so, so we knew exactly what we could what we could stream and what we can't stream. Right, got you. Yeah, yeah, right, got you. So there's nothing else on the forward plan that that's uh, that sort of um, that we need to look at on the, on this committee. Um, so I'm going to move on to item 13, which is the working group updates. The if you recall, there's travelers travelers um, working group. Um, and we were going to have a report come through to um, this committee early this this year. Um, I, I've had meetings with officers, and that is currently delayed because of um, officer resource. And I think it is understandable. I think I think the um, I think the officer responsible for for, for tra I think he's. Is it, Gareth, yeah, I think he's he's leaving or he's left now. So I think that that's been been the the major the major constraint in in that. And so um, currently that's that's delayed, but I have been promised that it will come through at, at uh, as, as soon as as soon as possible. Um, the other working group update up um, that's ongoing is the. Facilities for HG Drew drivers in Tamworth, and I know um, Ben has been been looking into that a little bit. Yeah, my apologies to committee once again. I haven't managed to tie any dates down, but I have sent an email out to the two other members of the subcommittee today, and we'll get that planned in in the next couple of weeks, and then definitely feedback at the next committee. Th thanks, thanks, Ben. Um, item 14 is our work plan. We've got. Um, a meeting coming up on the 16th, or will likely be the 16th, um, that we discussed earlier, and then one on the 24th of March, which will be the last one of the um, of, our, of our of our term. Um, 
and obviously our Crown Focus Day on the 15th, so I just wanted to uh, to highlight those. Um, I'm not entirely sure what we will... And we'll, we'll look at the 24th of March meeting as far as its work plan after after the the meeting on the 16th, I think, is, is probably the best thing for us to do. Um, any other comments on work plan items at the moment? It says on this agenda, future high streets fund update and waste management update. Yes, yeah, that's okay. That's it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, if there's no other comments on that, I'll close the meeting at 24 minutes past eight, and we didn't have to. Didn't have to have extend, extend the, uh, it. No, absolutely. Thank so, th thanks for attending, everybody, and thanks for everybody watching. <laughs> <laughs>